I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Good morning, everyone. For those of you who don't know, my name is Karen Miles. I'm the Associate for Faith Formation for the Diocese of California. I've been working with children and youth ministry for over 20 years, and I am so glad to be here this week because this gospel only comes around once every three years, (laughs) and I actually get to preach on it this time. You see, I also have this theory that Jesus was a youth minister. Uh, He had 12 people who just kind of followed him around a little bit. They were always hungry, yet never had anything to eat. They didn't understand pretty much anything he told them, and one of them tried to get him killed. So in today's gospel, the disciples are so very youth group. They are very, very human. Just last Sunday, literally 30 verses ago in the gospel of Mark, Jesus predicted his death, and they didn't understand and they panicked. Today, he tells them again, and they still didn't understand. But this time, they had the good sense to be embarrassed and just kept that to themselves. They were human. So this youth group keeps walking, and like you do on long trips, they started bickering in the back seat. If you have siblings, you probably can hear the words they used that whisper yelling, you're on my side, you're in my way, he likes me better, yeah, but I'm the best. And Jesus looks in the rearview mirror, basically, and says, what are you fighting about? Nothing. Nothing. Like any good youth minister or teacher or parent, Jesus knew exactly what they were fighting about. So when they went into the house and were greeted at the door, of course the young child in the family would race to say hello. And Jesus saw an opportunity to teach them without shaming them or calling them out on their mistakes. Yale Divinity School homiletics professor, Reverend Dr. Barbara Lundblad, speaks of the scene in this way. Jesus wanted them to see the child not because the child is innocent or perfect or pure or cute or curious or naturally religious. Jesus wanted them to welcome the child because the child was at the bottom of the social heap. In Mark, children are often sick or disabled. They are not symbols of holiness or innocence but more often they are the victims of poverty and disease. Jesus brings the child from the margins into the very center. This child is not a symbol, but a person, easily overlooked, often unseen and unheard. But of course, things surely are different now. In the year of our Lord, 2024, things are different. I mean. If you ask someone what they look for in a church, they usually talk about children's ministry and youth ministry and good parking and decent coffee. (laughs) So how do we actually do? I can tell you how the disciples did uh, poorly. In fact, in the very next chapter, 24 24 verses later, and spoiler alert, next week's gospel, They've already forgotten and are shooing children away from Jesus. Whoops. And they're human. As much as we want to receive children and young people just like Jesus did, it can be difficult. I mean, sometimes we make noises just as we all get quiet in prayer. That's when the two-year-old asks in that absolutely loud voice that only comes when everyone is quiet something embarrassing. They're on their phones playing a game. I mean, who left the bar- that Barbie shoe in the pew? And why is there a crayon here? And while we're at it, why are toddlers sticky? Now, churches like this one are usually big, 
grown-up spaces. Now, imagine being less than three feet tall. You can barely see over the pew in front of you, not to mention the view when everyone stands up. Churches generally aren't built with small humans in mind. So how do we welcome the smallest and the largest, the poorest and the richest, those who need healing and those who have been healed? When I was in fourth grade, the Catholic Church we went to let girls become altar servers, and this may come as a surprise to you, but I was a bit of a church nerd. Uh, and the idea of getting to be an active part of the service sounded so much less boring than life in the pew. And one of the pieces I remember most clearly was the blessing of the elements during communion itself. The altar was this big white marble slab that came to about like here-ish on the priests. Um, and since I didn't get the height genes in my family, it came to about here on me. Um, but they were prepared. They had this little wooden box hidden under the altar so that the altar server who was helping that day could actually see what was going on on the table. We could reach the service book and turn the pages. That one tiny piece of easily forgotten and overlooked furniture spoke so loudly to me. It said, we want you here. We want you to participate here. It's not the same without you here. Now, sometimes it's as simple as architecture. The rector of the church I worked at in Manhattan was proud to tell anyone that we were the only church on the island that had zero steps at the front entrance. Anyone could walk or roll into the church and directly into a pew. We were also able to keep the doors open most days from about 9 a.m. till about 6 p.m. for anyone who needed a place to be. It was cool in the summer, warm in the winter, dry in the rain and the snow, and unlike the Guggenheim next door, we'd let you use the bathrooms for free. And at that same church, when the offering plate was brought up to the altar, one child from his children's chapel would walk beside the usher with their fancy plate, and the child had a small, simple basket. The usher would hand over the plate, and the child would do the same with a few dollars collected from chapel. They would then turn around and run as fast as their little legs would carry them back to the open arms of their adult. And one Sunday, as I watched the standard proceedings from my spot in the back of the church, someone said, you know, you should really talk to them about walking back to the pew. And without thinking, I responded, if you can show me one adult who's that happy to be in here, I will. <laughs> After the initial panic of, oh my God, what did I just say? Washed over me, the person blinked, looked at me and said, never mind, you're right. We don't welcome children into our spaces just because they are cute and sometimes do funny things, even though they are, and they do. We welcome children because they are image bearers of God. The Holy Spirit resides in them as it resides in us. We include them in worship because they bring their prayers and praise alongside ours. They bring a joy and a wonder with them that hasn't been dulled by life. We welcome children because without them, the body of Christ is incomplete. And yes, we welcome children simply because Jesus told us to. Amen.